was in fact validated by the fact that he did conquer death. So, Paul identifies himself as a slave of Christ, called as an apostle, a sent one with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that there is salvation for sinners, for those who believe and trust in him. And he is the one that scripture has always talked about, and he is the one that God has sent. He is both man by the seed of David, and he is deity as the son of God. Because of him, because of this good news, because of the gospel, for all those who come, they have received the grace or unmerited of favor of God in verse 5. That is, they have been saved. They have been saved to the obedience of the faith. And we talked about the fact that the, that phrase, obedience uh, to the faith, is a synonym for salvation and it is, a, it is a message and it is a truth that is proclaimed to all the nations and it is available to all the nations. And in fact, we too are sent with that same message. And when you come, when you respond rightly to the gospel, you, are, you will enter into the family of God. You therefore will be one of the beloved ones, beloved of God. And you will be called a saint, a holy one, because when you enter into the family of God by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, his sins, your sins are taken by him to the cross and his righteousness is imputed or granted to you. And because of that, because of that, Paul greets them with a greeting that belongs only to us, only to us who are called, only to us who are beloved, only to us who are saints. And that is that grace abounds to you and you have peace with the Almighty God. And because you have peace with him and his wrath is no longer upon you, you can experience his peace in your life. And it's all because of Jesus and his work on the cross. As you come then to verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 8, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, what, what we're going to see as Paul continues this personal, um, this personal introduction of himself to these people and this very personal explanation of why he's writing to them and the fact that he cares about them, we, we begin to see and get great insight into this man, Paul. And I think it's important because, because we can learn from his uh, words about him so that we can follow and imitate him as he follows Christ because he possesses th this amazing submission to the Spirit of God and it's manifested in so many different areas of his life in a, in a supernatural way. And I want to point them out to you as we continue through these first introductory verses. In, in, there, in verse 8, then, he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Pa Paul is a thankful man. If you read uh, his epistles, you will find thanksgiving um, permeating throughout uh, his writings and his work. And it really doesn't matter where he is or what condition he is in. He's always grateful. He's always thankful. And, and he's thankful uh, at his core because he is the beneficiary of what he has just introduced to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is a recipient of that grace. He is one who has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is one who has been saved, and he knows it. And he's been forgiven, and he knows it. 
And so no matter what his life circumstances are, no matter what problems he has, it never stops him from being thankful because he is right with God. He is no longer on a pathway to hell. He is, in fact, on his way to heaven as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, called to a particular task that he loves and is excited about and is thankful for. Nothing in this world will cause him to lose his grateful heart because he possesses the Lord Jesus and he is right with his God. But here, he's talking particularly about being thankful for them. He's thankful for them. Now, um, n notice, notice something. He's thankful to God for them. But he isn't just thankful to God. He's thankful to my God. He, it is his God. There is a personal intimacy between Paul and his God. Th this is exceedingly unusual at this time. A Jewish people would not speak of their God in these kinds of personal, intimate terms. But Paul knows God. He knows Jesus. He, he is in fellowship with the Trinity in John's kind of words in 1 John. And it is that God, that God who has personally saved him, it is that Jesus who interceded in his life on the road to Damascus. It is that one who has taught him. It is that one who he speaks to and listens to. It is that one that he thanks. He thanks his God for them because the grace of God belongs to God. Salvation belongs to God. And we're going to see that in great detail as we move through this book of Romans. God is at all points sovereign, and we are exceedingly grateful for that. No one can stop the plans and the purposes of God, and therefore every promise that you possess is sure, because he is in control. And, and what does he thank God for? We thank God for them. And what does he thank God for them in? Well, it's in the reality of their faith. I, I, listen, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. He is the one through which we all come to the Father. There is no access to the Father except through Jesus. So he's thankful to the Father. He's thankful to the Son. And he's thankful that these people have been the beneficiaries of God's grace. And the reality of it is their real faith. That your faith. That your faith. N not a faith that you just claim. Not a faith that you just say, oh yeah, I believe that. Not that kind of faith. This, this is faith that's, that's visible. This is faith that causes people to, to take note. This is faith from people that are different. They are transformed. And because of that, their testimony is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now by that, they mean the whole empire of Rome, which was essentially the known world at that time. You, you, you know, the, the, the reputation of people doesn't go forward because you got a whole bu bunch of people saying, uh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. The reputation goes forward because these people are no longer pagans. They are now living lives that follow after Jesus Christ. They now have ca a character transformation. They are now virtuous people. They are people that desire the honor and glory of God. They are kind people, loving people, faithful people. They are different people and they can't be ignored in fact beyond that they're not only not ignored they're marveled at and the word goes forward that these people in Rome are different and they claim that that difference is because they believe in Jesus and he's changed them so Paul is a thankful person to his God and he is thankful to his God for all of those that have come to faith in Jesus Christ through the gospel that is his charge. In verse 9, we, we see something else about Paul. It says, uh, For God is my witness, whom I, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, 
that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Uh, Paul, Paul really cares about these people. I mean, it's, it's interesting that we have this theme of caring uh, in, the, in the church this weekend. What, what you see in the Apostle Paul is a man who cares. He, he loves these people. He, 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 doesn't, he isn't doing this simply out of duty. He's doing this out of love for them and concern for them. And how is it made manifest? Well, he says, I, I'm praying for you all the time. You, th that's one of the most profound ways you can care about someone is to pray for them and, and pray for them all the time and he wants them to know that he's praying for them and he, he wants to know how serious his commitment is that he's praying for them because he brings the credibility of God to his statement <laughs> God is my witness God is my witness now I I don't want to put any guilt trips on you, but when you say you're going to pray for somebody, right? Can you also say, and God is my witness that I'm doing it? <laughs> that God is my witness that I'm going to do it? We should. But I know we're guilty sometimes of saying, well, I'll pray for you, and somehow that just kind of gets lost on the prayer list or the activities of life. Not always, because I know you are praying people, but Prayer is not, um, not the fourth or fifth or sixth option for us. Prayer is the ultimate privilege that we have to bring the needs of our brothers and sisters before our loving and gracious God. But I would uh, call you uh, to account here to get a look at the kinds of things that Paul prays for. We've done this before, but I want to do it again. Go with me to Colossians this time, to Colossians chapter 1. Because Paul's prayers uh, take a, um, a little different tact that, than many of ours do. He says in uh, chapter 1 of verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Now this is the church in Colossae he's writing to. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His Son, of, of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Paul's prayers are for their spiritual health, for their spiritual growth, for their spiritual fruitfulness, and he praises God for all of it, all of the time. And he prays consistently, and he prays powerfully, he prays all the time for the church. Paul is a praying man out of a love for the church, for Christians. And he says he does it he says he does it to the God who he serves with my spirit in the gospel of his son. In other words, the prayers go out to this God he knows, this God he loves, and this God he serves. And how does he serve? He serves from the innermost parts of who he is, from his soul, from his spirit. He doesn't do it as part of some type of ritual or some type of ceremony or some type of external. He serves God because he loves him. 
because God first loved him and saved him. So Paul's a thankful man and Paul is a loving man and it's manifested in his life in a number of ways, one of which is prayer, prayer to the God that he loves and serves. Uh, one of the things he's praying for is in verse 10, he says, making a request, if by some means now, at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. But here again, we see something that it defines Paul. He is thankful and he is loving, but he is a man committed to the will of God. He wants nothing outside the will of God. And so his prayer is that he may be able to go to them and see them. Some of those people he knows, but most he does not. And he has a desire to be with them. And so he asks God for that, but he recognizes that he'll only get there in and by the will of God. If God has something else for him to do, he will do that. His priority is always to be God's priority. It is, um, it is what we pray, right, in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And I, I wonder sometimes, do we really mean it? <laughs> Sometimes it's worth just thinking on that for a minute. Do I really mean that? Do I, do I really mean that it's God's will at all costs, that I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do, even when it's not convenient, even when it might be uncomfortable, or, Lord forbid, it might be painful? <laughs> do I really want the Lord's will in my life, or am I always attempting to bend the Lord to my will in my prayers? Or am I thinking God's answering my prayers the way I want him to when I'm really not listening? I'm just assuming that God agrees with me, <laughs> whatever I want to do. Well, that's not Paul. Paul is a man who is committed uh, to the will of God. And then in uh, verse 11, he has a, he has priorities, and his priorities are spiritual priorities. He is, uh, he is loving, and he is thankful, and he is committed to God's will, and he is not wasting time. He is set about to use the days that God has given him for the purpose that God has given him. And so, with his desire to come to these people out of his care for them, it is not to have a vacation. Not that God's against vacations. I'm not saying that. But, but, he's, but his desire is to be with them so that, in verse 11, he can impart some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Now, this is not, this is not Paul imparting a spiritual gift that you would that you would read about in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. That, that, those gifts are provided by the Spirit of God. The spiritual gifts are gifts that each of us receive uniquely when we come to Christ. What Paul is saying here is he, he is desiring to come to impart spiritual benefit to you, uh, uh, spiritual help to you, to help you grow spiritually, to help you mature. I want to come and minister to you so that you can be established in the faith. You can be built up spiritually. It is, um, it is his desire to see Christians grow. And that should be all of our desires. We, we're in this process. It's, it, it's, it's why we're here. It's why we open the Word of God. It, it's why we take in truth and yield ourselves to it so that we can be changed. I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful that we get our problems solved if we get them solved the way we think. And that, that's, that's okay. But, but the essence of our objective as Christians is to be changed, grow in faith and the love of Christ so that he can use us 
wherever he desires to use us in his amazing plan to save souls. And we can give him the glory so that our faith will be a testimony around the South Bay. <laughs> we will be people that are transformed and obviously transformed in all of the relationships that we have, in all of the encounters that we have with the world, they'll say, who are you? <laughs> how can you live that way? How, how, can, how can you be that kind of person? How can you have that kind of trust? How can you live above your circumstances? How can you claim, proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ and then follow him so faithfully? How is that possible? Well, it's because of his grace, it's because of his power, and the reality of that power is worked out as he changes us and continually changes us as we grow more and more like Christ. And that's Paul's desire. You can only be established in the faith by truth. You can only be established in the faith by truth. You can only grow in the faith by truth. <laughs> Not by programs, by truth. <laughs> And Paul wants to come and bring truth. And how does he bring it? Well, he brings it to encourage them. He brings it to teach them. He may bring it to rebuke them. He, he brings it so that they'll increase in the knowledge of their God because as you know your God better, your faith grows, you trust him more. And you live your life based on trusting him, not what you can see and what feels right. So Paul's a man with great priorities great priorities. But here's another interesting aspect of Paul in verse 12. He says, that is that I may encourage together with you by mutual faith both of you and me. Are you kidding me? Do you realize who this guy is? He, he is, um, maybe, maybe there's some argument, but I, I will throw this out. He is the greatest theologian that ever walked the face of the earth, yeah. other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one who better understands the truths of God and better articulated them than Paul under the control of the Spirit of God. And influence? I mean, who, in a, at least in a New Testament sense, who would you look at and say had more influence on the world than Paul taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to three different continents on well, we will say four journeys, one as a prisoner and the rest, and, and just proclaiming steadfastly, boldly, every place he goes, the truth of the gospel and the spirit of God just moving in amazing ways. How many churches did he plant? How many people got saved? At the end of the book of Acts, someone estimated that there was over a half a million Christians in the world. And the reputation of those Christians turned the world upside down. That was the accusation on one of his trips. Their teachings have turned the world upside down. Well, what's that to say? Well, look at what he says here. He wants to come, and he wants to minister to them, and he wants to impart a spiritual growth to them, a spiritual gift, and then what does he say? And by the way, I want to be built up by you. I, I, I want to be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. I'm just one of you. I, I, I'm, just one of, I'm just one of you. I, I need to be encouraged by you, and I want to encourage you because we're in this thing together. He's a humble man. Paul's a humble man. One of the great scourges in the church, all down through the ages, are prideful leaders. People that are in it for themselves. People that want everybody to to bow down to them, to listen to them, to follow them, to give money to them, to think they're something. It's the death kneel of the truth. Paul is the one you want to look at. Look at his life. Look at his teachings. And everywhere you see a man humbled by the reality that he's loved by God and saved and forgiven. And that humility carries forward in all aspects of his life. He doesn't say, I, I, I was taught by Jesus. I know, I know everything. He was. <laughs> he doesn't know everything, but he was taught by the Lord. 
He says, you guys get ready because I'm coming. We'll get a big auditorium together and set up all the microphones and get the cameras, call the press. He just said, no, I just want to come and be with you guys and I want to help build you up and I want to be built up by you. And, uh, and he mentions in verse 13, now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I had often planned to come to you but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you, also that as among the other Gentiles. But Paul's answering questions as he goes. One of the questions that might have been, Paul, if you care so much about us, how come you haven't come? I mean, it's been a long time. What, what, what's held you back? And Paul says, hey, I really wanted to come, but I was hindered. And essentially what he's saying, I was hindered, and therefore it wasn't in the will of God yet, but I'm still hoping that God's going to make a way for me to come. But, but I want you to understand, my, my priority has come to minister to you, but that ministry is going to have some result. In other words, we're just min not ministering to minister. We're ministering so that you can be built up. So that what? So that you can bear fruit. We're not going to build everybody up and sit everybody in the room and sing songs together, although we can do that once in a while. <laughs> We're getting built up so that we can go bear fruit, so that we can be transformed, so that we can go out into the world and see God save lost souls. Spiritual fruit is attitude fruit. That's uh, Galatians 5.22. That's, that's the mark of the transformed soul, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, all of that which is born in and out of your life by the Spirit of God if you are a believer and if you're walking under his control. And that's Paul's desire. He wants us to be more and more under the control of the Spirit of God. It's not only attitude fruit, though it's action fruit. It's praising God, and it's giving, and it's reproduction. In Romans 16, verse 5, Paul says this, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epineus, who is the first fruits of Achaia, to Christ. Who is that? Well, it's just a person. <laughs> and who are they? They're fruit. They're the first fruit, first fruits of Achaia, the area, that area of the world. One of the first ones saved. Spiritual fruit is the transforming work of God in your life, and spiritual fruit is a result of that transforming work, which is you go out with the gospel and you see people get saved. So, Paul wants to come, but he was hindered, but he's coming. When he does come, he's coming to minister to them, to build them up so that they can be about the work that God has for them. Here's an interesting part of Paul's persona. He says, uh, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. What does that mean? Well, in all, in all the aspects of Paul's personhood, uh, this one is often overlooked. I mean, he's clearly a thankful, loving man seeking after the will of God, setting his priorities right, seeking to minister among people to build them up so that they can bear fruit in the kingdom. That's what we're all about. But listen to this as, a, as part of his heart. He says, I am a debtor. I'm in debt. I have an obligation, he says. Now, you, you might say, well, of course you have an obligation to God, the one who saved you. And, and I'm sure Paul would say, absolutely, that's right. I, I, that, that's true. I have an obligation of love, an, an obligation to respond rightly to the one who's loved me. But that isn't his point here. His point here is, I am moved under an obligation to lost people. Are you? <laughs> one commentator said, it's like this. If you're walking down the street and you some, see somebody's house on fire, you are under obligation to go knock on that door. Obligation to start screaming. Obligation to do something to let them know that they're in danger. Get the garden hose out. Start fighting the fire. It's an obligation. 
And that's essentially what he says here. I'm under obligation to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. Those are the little couplets. Greek goes with wise and barbarian goes with unwise. Not because they're better or worse. It's because the Greeks think that way. The Greeks look at themselves as the wise and they look at everyone else as barbarians and the unwise. And so Paul takes both ends of the, script, uh, the, the spectrum in a Greek thought process and says, everybody, I'm under obligation to everyone, to the people that are the uh, elite and the smart, and I'm under obligation to those that are not so elite and not so smart. And what's my obligation? Well, they're in danger. I think we've lost that in the church, that the people who aren't saved are really in danger. They're going to go to hell. Forever. If you're going to go to heaven, they're going to hell. That's the gospel, and we'll see it as Paul opens it up to us. It's not an either-or deal. It, it, it is that, that they need someone to go tell them of the love of Jesus and warn them what the consequences are if you spurn the love of Jesus. You just have to keep trying. Uh, Barbara and I were out the other day, and we were uh, involved in purchasing something. A guy was filling out the paperwork, and so we just started talking to him, and um, and we gave him the gospel, and there was absolutely no response. He was not antagonistic. He wasn't very we very curious. He had an interesting story. I won't take any time to share it with you here, but but when you come out of that, you say, well. Lord, please open his eyes. Because his house is on fire. <laughs> he, he just doesn't know it. But, but we're trying to tell him. And that's all God calls us to do. That's our obligation. That's why we're debtors to people that we come in contact with. We're in debtors. You're, you, you're indebted to your neighbors and to your lost family members and to people that, uh, that God brings across your path. It is, uh, it is an obligation that Paul says, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So this obligation, it's not something Paul shrinks from. It's something Paul runs to. He's eager to engage in the obligation he has both to his God and his Savior and to the lost people that need this gospel that God has appointed him to take to the world. And he does it eagerly. And he does it boldly, without fear. And he takes it to those that love him in the intricacies of that gospel, which we're going to see opened up to us in this amazing letter. And he takes it to the lost people who need uh, to be saved. Paul's an amazing man. It's going to cost him everything this world would hold dear. But he never loses his faith and his trust in his God. He never loses his joy from the, from the record that we see. or his thankfulness because he understands that there's nothing more important than the call that God has placed on his life. It's the call of being a sent one with the gospel. And while we're not one of the twelve, we're sent with the same gospel to warn people and to offer them the amazing unmerited grace of God to be forgiven and to be brought into his family. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your truth and this amazing letter that we're just starting, uh, Father. But we're so grateful for the Apostle Paul who lived out the truths that he taught in such a powerful way. And we know, Lord, that he didn't do it in his own strength. He would never say that, only by the power of your spirit in him. But he so consistently submits to your spirit, Lord, and is led by him. And we want to follow after Paul as he followed after you. We, too, want to be people who are grateful, thankful people 
We want to be people, Lord, that seek to submit to your will wherever it takes us and whatever the cost. And we want to love and care for one another, and we want to love and care for the lost. We want to encourage one another to be built up into the very likeness of your Son, and we want to run to the neighborhoods, warning of the fire that's burning down their houses, Lord. Help us to be eager to engage in the most amazing adventure anybody could ever have, and that is life with you, Jesus. Help us to keep our priorities right and follow closely after you into this adventure. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.